I hope you all took a little bit of a break between these sections. And if you didn't, we can do a quick check in slash body break. So let's just move our bodies a little bit, whether it's just wiggling your body or dancing to your favorite song or doing some yoga or some stretching. Um, And if you're really ambitious, maybe try out some jumping jacks and some squats. (laughs) Let's just say I did my squats before recording this video, so (laughs) that'll count as my body break. All right, so we are going to talk about bystander intervention now which we think is super important for you all as middle and high school educators because knowing how to intervene when you hear someone say a microaggression or if someone gets misgendered or any type of scenario like that, we want you to feel equipped and ready as an active ally for all of our LGBTQ plus students. So the basic steps of bystander intervention are noticing the event, So always kind of having our hawk eyes on and being aware of what's going on in our classroom or outside of it and being aware of certain scenarios that could at some point escalate into a situation where you need to intervene. That's also really valuable to have that kind of awareness. Um, Then to interpret it as a problem, take whatever happened seriously and take responsibility for acting, then decide how to help. It will most likely vary by situation because of what happened and who was involved and what the setting is, who else is around, etc. And lastly, and arguably most importantly, uh, take action. So it's incredibly important to do something rather than nothing. Um, So don't need to overthink too much about what you need to do, but instead just do something. So take some kind of action. Any kind of action is better than just standing by as a witness. Um, because no matter what action we take, we decide to act in the moment in order to prioritize the safety and the well-being of our LGBTQ plus students. And that's ultimately our goal and what's most important. So before we dive further into bystander intervention, we want to deconstruct the concept of discipline. Um, So when we discuss bystander intervention, we don't want to think about, uh, think of it as how to deliver the right type of punishment. We really want to address homophobic and transphobic words or actions through education instead of punishment. Um, And of course, we want to ensure and prioritize the healing and safety for the victim or whoever was affected by the act. But our goal of intervening in those moments is reparation, really, again, instead of punishment. So we want to repair the harm that was done as best we can, in addition to focusing on accountability and educational and personal growth from the person who committed the act of harm. If possible, we'd love to use that reparation of harm towards rebuilding and strengthening the relationship between our community members as well, whether it be with students or faculty and staff, parents, etc., Um, We don't want to completely dismiss people for their lack of understanding, but we also cannot tolerate inappropriate behavior. And that's where our job comes in to focus on education instead of the actual punishment. So as opposed to a more punitive form of justice, these are other guiding frameworks for reparations such as restorative justice and transformative justice. So restorative justice focuses on healing and calls for accountability for those who have done harm uh, to make things right versus punishment, like we've discussed. So this type of justice, um, if facilitated correctly, is useful for interpersonal conflicts um, and the impacts that that can have on the parties involved. Then transformative justice is more about the community and addressing the systems of power and oppression that causes harm, um, whether structurally or interpersonally. And with this form of justice, we seek to transform those systems or norms or structures that are in place. So we can recognize that these issues are system-wide and that they're ingrained in us and that they naturally teach us harmful behaviors. So transformative justice is especially useful for setting values and for addressing systemic issues in community change. And then another way to look at these types of justice is through these questions that you can see on the slide. So if a harmful situation occurs, we can look at it restoratively and ask questions like who has been hurt and what are their needs? Who must be accountable for those needs, to those needs, sorry. How can they be accountable? And how can we preserve agency and safety for those who have been harmed? 
So again, this type of justice can be really useful in restoring peace and agency and repairing harm that was done in interpersonal conflicts. Um, The biggest point for me here about restorative justice is the accountability part, because I've seen firsthand that just acknowledging who has been hurt and how they were hurt is not enough. There needs to be a system of accountability that can truly repair harm instead of just acknowledging harm. And then for transformative justice, we can look at situations with questions like what social circumstances prompted the harmful behavior, what structural similarities exist between this incident and others like it, and what measures could prevent future occurrences. So again, transformative justice examines the systems and the barriers in place that prevent growth individually and from a community perspective. And then we seek to undo harm and create change through coming up with measures that are preventative. So bringing this all together, we can keep both of those guiding frameworks in mind for bystander intervention. So how can we restore and transform a situation where we need to intervene? Um, we can look at five the five D's of bystander intervention, with direct being the first. So if we hear name calling or microaggressions, misgendering, bullying, or harassment, we need to immediately and directly address the situation. So instead of saying something vague like, what do you mean by that? We want to address whatever was said directly. So something like, that language is unacceptable in this classroom, or that word is a slur and I don't want to hear it used, and that language is inappropriate and hurtful to LGBTQ plus people. So as you can tell, that language is very specific and direct in addressing the harm. Um, And we also don't want to bring attention to the student that was harmed. So we should check in with that student privately at another time. But the focus on the direct statement should be the harm instead of who was harmed. So the next D would be distract, which could be a tool that you implement um, that's a little more indirect and but is useful depending on the situation if it needs to be de-escalated, for example. So later on in the slides, you'll see a workshop slide where you'll get the chance to work through some scenarios and how you would intervene as a bystander. But I wanted to give an example for distract based on one of those scenarios. So There's one scenario that explains that you are teaching a lesson about LGBTQ plus issues and the conversation veers in a problematic direction. A student has launched into an explanation about how trans youth should not be allowed to play sports and other students have started calling out to voice their agreement on the subject. You see another student who is trans getting upset. They are slouching down in their chair and avoiding eye contact with others. Now this would be a situation where you could use distract since other students are chiming in on it, I'm assuming in rapid succession, which means the situation is escalating. Um, That's exactly how the situation escalates when others start chiming in. So here you could change the subject in order to pull the attention of the person causing harm away from the other student. Um, Then of course, following up with the trans student privately to check in on what they need. Um, And eventually this could lead to a lesson you teach about why trans youth should be allowed to play sports in a league based on their gender, uh, based on the gender they identify with. Um, And the conversation could be more contained in that way if you um, have that conversation at a separate time. But in the moment, that could be an example of how you could distract. Um, And then let's see, the next D is delegate. So um, or getting help from someone else. That's another way to say that. So another scenario for this situation would be a student consistently refuses to use another student's correct pronouns. You have made some interventions in your classroom, but the student has responded by saying things like, I just don't think they them pronouns are grammatically correct. You're having difficulty balancing this ongoing issue with the needs of the full class and your curriculum goals for class periods. So in this scenario, if you already have tried other forms of intervention, as you can see here, perhaps you directly addressed the misuse of pronouns several times, um, then this might be a good time to get help from the school counselor or an administrator or another teacher. And then from there, you could decide whether to talk to the parents or what other actions might be needed. Um, And then another thing you could actually do in this situation is actually about the next D, which is document. So making a note of an occurrence to refer to at a later date is a good thing to do if you witness a student getting bullied 
um, or specific recurring issues like this one we just discussed in that scenario. So if conversations need to be had with parents or other staff, then writing the, uh, down exactly what happened and doing it immediately will be helpful to avoid hearsay and misremembering and things like that. Um, and then even writing certain things up in an email to have that paper trail is really helpful too. Um, and of course, document would be a step that would need to be paired with some kind of action too. We can't just document and then leave it at that. And then the last D is delay. So this is one that we've already mentioned a few times already, actually, in, in other scenarios before. Um, but it's so, so important to check in with everyone involved in the situation after the incident happened. So, of course, check in with the student that was harmed privately um, and provide that active allyship and support by listening to their needs and, if needed, come up with action steps or a plan for how to repair the harm. And again, this is an opportunity for us as active allies to rebuild trust, to repair harm, like I said, to care for our LGBTQ plus students and continue that education process as well for everyone involved. So if you could take a moment and look over these three brainstorming questions. Um, so what instances of harm or inappropriate behavior have you witnessed at your school? Can you think of any moments where you could have taken action or did take action to support LGBTQ plus students or positive school culture around these topics? Um, and this is always interesting for us to hear about, but what microaggressions are part of school culture or do you hear frequently or even infrequently at your particular school or in your particular role as an educator? So if you could take a few minutes to journal about that, think about that, um, talk to your peers or coworkers about that, you can pause the video here if you'd like. Um, but speaking of microaggressions, I, I wanted to also go to the next slide. Um, and as you can see, these are some microaggressions that we've actually heard in our mid middle school or high school communities. Um, and they usually can be categor categorized as an invasive question, a harmful joke, or misguided or potentially harmful confusion. Um, so these are the examples of these are examples of things you might hear in your class or even when students are passing by in the halls and those kind of non classroom moments. Um, and these always need to be addressed. So again, depending on the situation, you can use one of the five D's we just learned about. But we also want to remind you that it's so incredibly important just to do something rather than nothing. Um, so instead of just standing by as a witness, again, we need to prioritize the safety and well-being of LGBTQ plus students in the moment. So um, if, you know, if you're in the moment and you can't quite remember all the five Ds or what the right situation might be, depending on what's going on, that's okay. This takes some practice, but again, just try to do something. Um, and then from there, we'll, you know, we'll work on it together and we'll get through it. Um, and then lastly, here is that slide that I mentioned earlier on, where if you pull up the notes section on the slide deck, you might actually have to move that section up um, on your browser. Um, but you'll see four different scenarios that we'd like you to go over and determine which method or methods of bystander intervention you'd use. And if you could think about what you would actually say in the moment, that would be great. You could write out a little script if you want, maybe bonus points for that. Um, but yeah, th it's, it, this is something that takes a lot of practice and really gets so much easier with practice. And especially in a, in a space where you're just practicing on your own, it's a safe space to make mistakes and to learn other things that you can do. Um, so we'd all love for you to practice that. And we believe in you all as active allies and we know you can do it. So good luck. <laughs>